Greetings and welcome to this joint TCMI ASIST webinar. I am Anna Baptista, the chair of TCMI. It is my pleasure today to introduce the joint webinar series and today's presenter and topic. The joint TCMI ASIST webinars are presented as a service to members of TCMI and ASIST and to guests. The purpose of joint series is to advance the discourse and practices of innovative metadata. This webinar is presented by Karen Coyle, who is a very experienced professional in library technology, an active contributor to TCMI and standards committees, committees and who is currently co-chairing the W3C Working Group on Dataset Exchange Metadata. The webinar will introduce application profiles, a topic that is getting increased attention from several semantic web related communities, including DCMI and the W3C. This webinar is very much related to the last webinar on checks. If you missed it, don't worry, because both will be available in a few weeks' time in the DCMI YouTube channel you will have an opportunity to ask the presenter questions near the close of the webinar. There is a panel on the right of your screen to enter the text of your questions. We ask that you wait to enter your text until near the end of the webinar. I will moderate the questions and answers. We will address as many questions as our time allows. With that, I'll turn the podium over to Karen Coyle. Thank you, Anna. So I was asked to give a brief introduction to metadata application profiles. You will hear me refer to them as application profiles and simply as profiles. For the purposes of this uh, webinar, it's all the same thing, just a shortening of the terms. So we have all been um, warned about data silos, that we don't want to have our data in silos. Data that's in silos can't play well with other data, can't be part of a sort of a global sharing uh, information economy. And when we think of data silos, we tend to think of um, situations where different people are using different formats or different forms of their metadata. In fact, those, those are data silos, but in fact, we also have data silos when we're all using the same metadata, uh, metadata standard in theory. And if you talk to anyone who has spent time trying to combine um, data from different sources, you'll, you'll hear them say that there's always something, there's always something that's different. Every organization has its own practices, every organization has its own needs. And, um, <clears throat> and there are even slight variations in how uh, people have interpreted how terms should be used. And so what I'm gonna talk about today is how application profiles, as we, especially as we think of them in Dublin Core, might be able to help in these situations. So first, what are application profiles? Um, application profiles are a way for you to record your organization's or your project's choices about your metadata. But even before they become a communication to others, application profiles help you as a group within your own organization develop a consensus around what you want your data to be and how you want to um, input your data, what you want it to represent. It can express specific practices and rules, but it also, of course, tells any consumers of your data what they should expect. We need application profiles because otherwise, how can someone else understand your data well enough to make use of it? And again, this is something that has occupied many, many hours of time in our communities, which is someone receiving data from another source, 
and spending a long amount of time looking through the data, trying to understand what it is that, um, that has been intended with that data. So an application profile should communicate that to others. And it's not unlike the open source problem, or at least I think of it that way. Many people will create a program or some code, and they'll just declare that it's open, therefore it's open source. But unless there's support behind it, uh, unless there is good documentation, there's probably very little chance that people can make use of it. So application profiles are needed uh, throughout the process. Anyone who is providing data needs application profiles uh, that help them uh, understand what their own data is supposed to achieve. Uh, it can um, be used even to control user input forms, that type of thing. And anyone who's going to access the data needs application profiles to understand the data. And ideally, we want application profiles to be both for people and for machines. And I'm going to show you some examples. So what does an application profile do? What is it? Well, it gives you the basic structure of the data. It's this, you want to say, what, what is the story that your data is telling? What is it that you're trying to say? What are your things? How do you describe your things? What are the properties or data elements? And what are the rules for how those are used? And then what are the values? What's the actual data that, you, uh, that you're going to be providing? And a question today is, what's a profile going to look like? How's it going to be implemented? Very often today, Profiles are either documents, many times a PDF, or spreadsheets. Less common is that a full profile is provided as code, uh, whatever type of code. Um, and this is what we're trying to get further along at, which is to have our application profiles be provided in code so that they can be directly used by machines. So you may be wondering what's an application profile look like. And I'm just going to show you a couple <clears throat> because there is no standard today for application profiles. So they can have different looks. This is a uh, chunk of a profile based on the data set catalog vocabulary DCAT. And there are a number of different DCAT application profiles because this is a standard vocabulary being used primarily in Europe for data sets, for government data sets. And each country has found itself with a need to have some slightly different elements in its, um, in its DCAT uh, data. And so, <clears throat> They have each uh, created uh, application profiles. This one happens to be in a, a PDF document. And at the beginning of the document, there's quite a bit of explanation of what the data set is about, <clears throat> excuse me, what the profile is about, et cetera. Another profile uh, is BibFrame. BibFrame, uh, from the library world primarily, uh, has a uh, a, a sort of cascade of profiles. They're all provided in this nice display with buttons, um, giving the classes and properties. This is an RDF vocabulary, so <clears throat> it's classes and properties. And then each individual term has a description of this nature. So Dublin Core has had the idea of application profiles since at least the late 1990s. And it fits in well as a Dublin Core activity, because after all, Dublin Core is a general purpose, highly reusable vocabulary that, in fact, is one of the most reused vocabularies today on the semantic web. So it is going to be a component of many people's metadata, which means that it would be a component 
of many people's application profiles <clears throat> if they exist. It was in 2007 that uh, the, the main basis, uh, theoretical basis for Dublin Core application profiles was presented. And in keeping with the tradition of naming things for the city where they took place, this is called the Singapore framework because it was developed during a meeting in Singapore. It has evolved a bit since then, uh, but still is essentially uh, the same philosophically. So the, the Singapore framework has three levels. The very bottom level is, of course, the foundation standards, which in this case um, are given as RDF, but they could be something else. You could have um, XML or something of that nature. The next level up is about the standards that exist in your community of sharing. So the domain model, vocabularies, et cetera. And then the actual application profile is not a single thing, but is really a, a kind of a workflow that is built up um, as you develop your application profile. So let's look at a few of these things individually. A domain model. Um, what is a domain model? A domain model, here's an example of a domain model that you may have seen. A domain model is a general model of what are, what is the scope of your metadata. Um, in this case, the domain model is done with nice diagrams, uh, nice pictures, but here's another domain model which is equally as good as a domain model, uh, <clears throat> which is done more as a data model. So domain models can exist at various different levels depending on, on what you need, but essentially everything that you're going to describe fits into your domain model. Something that we often don't get to, in, even though it should be one of the first steps, is the creation of functional requirements. And functional requirements are that before you start developing any solutions, you need to define your problems. You need to decide which of those problems you can solve. And the other thing, which again is often forgotten, is that you need to say how you're going to know that you've been successful. What does success look like in your environment? So before embarking on the creation of an application profile, you should sit down, and this is part of the consensus building process, you should sit down and work out what your functional requirements are. Now, application profiles are prim primarily vocabularies. They, they are your metadata terms. And there are various ways an application profile can use vocabularies or reuse. They generally reuse vocabularies. They reuse vocabularies that have been uh, defined elsewhere. They can be a selection from a single vocabulary, or they can actually extend a vocabulary. So selection from a single vocabulary is kind of a narrowing. There's this huge vocabulary. I'm only going to use these 20 or 40 or 60 uh, elements. But you, you can also extend a vocabulary, which, for example, is what has happened in DCAT, because each individual um, group that was going to use DCAT had some needs that hadn't been anticipated in the base vocabulary, and so they were able to extend it by adding terms from other vocabularies. And a profile can be actually just a, a, a combination of vocabularies without there being any one that is um, a base. So BibFrame is an example of a profile that is a selection from a single vocabulary. Each one of these uses only terms from BibFrame, but each one is a view or a section of what BibFrame provides for, as you can see, for different purposes. Um, 
of, in the DCAT vocabularies, you can see that there are, there are properties from different data sets. So you have DCAT, you have FOF, uh, and there are many others. So where needed, the DCAT has brought in terms from other vocabularies and combined them. There's some tricks to reusing someone else's vocabulary terms. Uh, and it's, it's, it's one of the more difficult uh, aspects of creating your metadata or your metadata profile. When you reuse someone else's terms, you may need to narrow what the term means, but you should never contradict how the term is used at, or defined at its origin. In other words, if it is defined as being um, a person's name, uh, you can reuse it by saying, you know, you can only have one, or I'm going to define this as being the name of certain people, but you shouldn't ever contradict how it's used because that is going to create confusion. When you encounter a vocabulary that you think you would like to reuse, but it turns out to have very strict definitions, uh, this you find often people who've developed a vocabulary in OWL <clears throat> and they have constraints like making things disjoint from other things, uh, making terms disjoint, or uh, have a limit on what can be the valid values. These are the hardest vocabularies to reuse. One of the reasons why Dublin Core is so widely reused is that it employs what we call a minimum semantic commitment. In other words, it, it has a very broad definition so that um, it is easy to reuse and to narrow down. And in fact, what we're hoping is that as people begin to use application profiles, that we will see developed, and there, there do exist many of like this, sort of general purpose vocabularies. Uh, there are things like bio and, and, um, and others that are very broad, and those will allow a lot of reuse. So if you've done all of this, you've selected, you know your functional requirements, you've selected your uh, data elements, then you need to create your profile. And here I wish I could say that we know exactly how to do this, um, that we have a standard for this, but we do not yet have a standard for this. But I'm going to talk about what, how we're working on that. So what are the components of your profile? Well, there are a lot of things that you can include in a profile. Um, it, a profile almost always has the vocabulary terms. Uh, it's a good idea to have definitions of those terms, to have usage rules. You want to say which terms are mandatory, which are optional, whether or not they're repeatable, that's cardinality. Examples, as we know, people learn more from examples than they, than they do from reading uh, text of, of rules. And then your validation rules. How do you know whether or not you have a valid data? So using the, the DCAT example that I used before, you can see that it gives the, the name of the property. So this is what you would display to a human. This is the actual property identifier. Because this is an RDF vocabulary, this tells you what to expect in terms of a value. So the description is going to be literal, it's going to be plain text. And as a matter of fact, the usage note says it's a free text account. In terms of cardinality, we have uh, two different things here. We have the formal cardinality. This means that you have to have one but there's no limit on how many you can have. And then there's this group called recommended, and recommended is something I'll talk about that in a moment. Recommended is very difficult to do in a machine-readable way, 
but this gives the information in a um, in a text. Here's an example of a application profile that uses examples and that gives an example for each of its data elements, which is probably very helpful for the human user. Now, validation is a really tricky thing. We want to be able to say, is this or is this not valid data? Today, validation is usually done as part of your uh, description of your data element or of your uh, usage text. So you could say in your documentation for humans that this can have a FOF name or you want a FOF for name plus family name. You can say that the date cannot be less than or greater than a certain year. And you can say that all subjects have to come from this vocabulary list. So saying that to humans is actually fairly, uh, fairly simple. It can be done. Validating by machine is quite a bit trickier. There are ways to validate uh, that aren't RDF, such as XML schema. So if your data is in XML, you can have XML schema. If you're using RDF, we, there are now two different validation languages. Uh, one of them is a W3C recommendation, the Shapes Constraint Language, Shackle. If you uh, are doing your work in RDF and are using um, the uh, product top braid, this is built into that. And you can formally write your validation rules and you can validate your data. <clears throat> Shex is a community group. It's called Shape Expressions. Uh, and if you go to Shex.io, and if you attended the previous webinar, you pro probably know more about it than I do. Um, <clears throat> so if you don't have this kind of validation, what you end up with, and what many people do in their jobs today, is you end up with uh, human written validation rules. And someone has to sit down, read those, turn them into code and run that code against your data. This is very time consuming. The reason why we would like to have machine readable validation rules <clears throat> is we want to automate that process and make it more precise. The difficulty with this is that validation as written in code is hardly simple. This is code that basically says, if for my data element status, it can be assigned or unassigned, simply that. And it takes this to say that. And this is in a sort of more extended version of Shex, and in Shackle, I'm sure that it would be as complex, if not more. There is a, there could be, and there is in, in, in Shex, a shorter version of this, but it's still code. And if you think about validating all of your metadata, you can see how this turns out to be quite a bit of code. And let's face it, not all of us are coders or have a coder on staff. So, there's also the problem that not everything can be validated. There's an awful lot, and you know, my area of expertise is library data. There is an awful lot that cannot be validated. You can't validate recommended. <laughs> um, you can't validate mandatory if applicable. And you can't validate an awful lot of string data, or even to know, for example, <clears throat> if someone has assigned the proper subject heading to um, a resource. 
so we we have a, a validation problem which we might be able to partially solve um, but generally speaking for uh, especially for cultural heritage data human beings are always going to be needed as with anything else that you create you have to think about maintaining it and again this is a step that is often ignored um, as you create a profile you have to say who's going to maintain it how will you add new terms what's the process going to be because adding new terms is going to change everything for everybody using your data what can and cannot be changed sometimes people have rules that they will not change anything that isn't compatible with what already exists I mean if people have already created data you have to think about how any changes will affect them. And how could a profile be extended? If you've created a profile as with the DCAT profile where it was then extended by many other people, um, you need to have a sense of how it is extended so that those extensions preferably would be compatible. So what do we need so that we can create profiles and hopefully create them in, uh, in an easy way? I can tell you about a few profile-related efforts. Uh, Dublin Core, again, since the late 1990s and then based on the Singapore framework, has been uh, looking at and <clears throat> creating um, creating some suppositions about how we might do application profiles. Um, these are two documents. The, the Singapore Framework document explains the concept of application profiles. And then there was a document um, that I did with Tom Baker that expresses some uh, profile guidelines. The Data Exchange Working Group in W3C, which I'm co-chairing, uh, has as one of its deliverables a document that would give people guidance on the creation of application profiles. So much of what I've been talking about here today will probably be found in that document. They will not be producing a, an application profile <clears throat> language, which is still something that is needed. So one of my goals is to see if we can't come up with a simple core standard profile language. And we want a profile language that shows the domain model, shows the things that, that are in your domain, that lists the vocabulary terms, that can express basic rules for your vocabulary, especially cardinality and what valid values are. And that also provides documentation for human readers. The generic domain model that Dublin Core has developed looks something like this. This is a very simplified uh, version, of course. But your application profile, your profile, lists all of the resources, the things. About those things, it lists the properties or the terms or elements, if you're not using RDF speak. And then it gives the rules for the data. So that's very simple. And, uh, and we <clears throat> developed a, a sort of a, a, a version of it uh, in kind of pseudocode in the profile guidelines document. So taking a, a, the idea of a profile that's about books, um, you would say this is uh, the profile, give it any name you want. And in terms of our resources, our things, we uh, just making this up, obviously, as an example, we have books and people. So one resource would be a book, another resource is a person. For each of those, you would define 
what the properties are. So the properties of a book or title, author and size, making this up, property of person is a name. Then you begin to add um, some rules. So a book has to have uh, one, at, it has to have a title and at most it can have one title. It can have no authors or it can have up to three authors. Size, it can have, <clears throat> it has to have one but it can only have one. And then there would be others for name. And <clears throat> when you start adding in what the rules are for the values, the title is going to be a literal. The author, let's say that we want the author to be a link, so it's an IRI. The size, let's say we're going to have it be an integer. And when you get to this point, you realize that you're essentially creating an entity relation diagram. But what you don't have here is um, the information <clears throat> that you would want to have for humans. But using this, it could be possible to create a, um, a um, <clears throat> excuse me, a vocabulary for application profiles. So this is a beginning um, in which uh, we're down at the property or statement level. Um, I'm not showing the whole thing, it would be way too big. But you can see that it has uh, <clears throat> the term as it would be read by a human being. It has the cardinality. It tells you what, what term would be used, um, <clears throat> what actual RDF um, value it would use, and then what is the value of that. <clears throat> so in a sense, as I'm creating this, um, I realize that this is an application profile for an application profile. And so my vocabulary for an application profile is itself an application profile. And I have to warn you that if you start thinking about things in terms of application profiles, just about everything is an application profile. Um, but um, as a simple um, core type vocabulary, Something like this may make it possible for anyone who's creating metadata to create their metadata in something as simple as a spreadsheet. And that is our goal, in a sense, um, is to have something that is simple and that can be done in the, with the tools that people use today. And of course, as we know today, Many people use spreadsheets or something similar to spreadsheets, columns, to define their application profiles. And we saw that in the DCAT profiles, but you, we, you see it all over. So can we give people an easy way to present their application profile? And then can we develop a way to convert that into machine readable code that could then help those consumers of data or the people who are uh, creating, for example, uh, user input forms to help them automate much of the process of, of metadata creation and reuse. One of the big questions is, can we make validation easy? Validation is not easy. And the other question is, what part of validation can we reasonably include in a machine-readable application profile that is done in this Dublin Core simple way? Fairly easy to uh, list the valid properties, um, as you see here, you would have your list of properties. Valid value types, possibly um, 
you would have types and lists, this is something that we can probably do. But <clears throat> it isn't quite so likely that we'll be able to come up with a simple way to handle what we call the conditional rules. And these are the ones that if if you don't have, you, if you have A, then you can't have B, or if you have A, you have to have B and C. These don't fit very well into a, um, a, a, a kind of a spreadsheet kind of <clears throat> mentality because they, they have relationships between things. So we're trying to think of whether there might be a way to have some kind of validation pseudocode that could be included, uh, even simpler than the, the simple Shex pseudocode or Shex code um, that could then be turned into one of the validation standards. And then the big question is, what do you do with the non-actionable statements such as mandatory if applicable? And um, if you, if so, there will be things that cannot be, um, cannot be validated. So that's basically what I have. I want to um, give you a sort of a summary of what I see as the functions of a profile, that we want to use a profile to build consensus within our organization. Uh, this is a very important uh, an, an important sort of metadata building uh, activity that c building consensus around the data is where we tease out all of the issues that uh, we will that will be encountered by the person who's actually trying to create the metadata. We want to tease those out before we get to the point of creating the metadata. We want to document our metadata. Um, <clears throat> and again, there's documentation and there's documentation. There's, you know, we know that there's huge documentation around uh, library metadata and other metadata, um, <clears throat> but it does, that, that official documentation does not address any of the many, many um, variations that a particular organization will encounter. So um, you will have your own lists of valid values. You know, what, what are the locations? Uh, only you know what your valid locations are. <clears throat> All of this is what can be documented in a, an application profile and therefore making it easier to create uh, input systems and make it easier for you to exchange your data with others. We want input and output control. We want to be able to check validity uh, at the time that data is created, at the time that data is received, and at the time that we exchange our data with others. So being able to um, to say uh, this is this is or is not valid is very important, and I want to bring up something which um, one of our uh, Dublin Core uh, members, uh, Stephanie Rule, often talks about, which is that not only do you want to say this is valid and this is not valid, you want to be able to when you receive data from people if you're the sort of official uh, recipient or uh, even when you're sending data to be able to say you know this looks suboptimal this is where we get to the recommended that type of thing where you can look at an entire file and say <clears throat> you know you haven't used any of the recommended data elements this isn't a yes no type thing there's a lot of um, advisory information that we could include uh, or we could give as feedback to others. And then, of course, we want to be able to actually validate, validate 
um, where validation is possible. Um, that's an extremely important function. And, and it's one that today is taking a lot of people's time. So if we want to say, save the time of the user, we need to be able to automate a certain amount of this because right now in our environments, there are people spending a huge amount of time trying to make data shareable or reusable, but not having the means to do so because there is uh, insufficient information and insufficient machine readable information that would allow them to do that. So I want to thank you here. Um, <clears throat> I want to let you know that there is uh, work being done on Dublin Core, and hopefully over the next few months, we'll be able to announce some of this. Uh, we're kind of organizing it at the moment. Um, if you want to see some of the things that I have worked on, um, you can go to my GitHub uh, site, uh, which is under KCOIL, and it's called RDFAP, and don't pay a whole lot of attention to that name. That was That's kind of a legacy. Um, thing <laughs> from some earlier work that we did. Um, and in addition, uh, DCAT, if you uh, follow the work going on in W3C, there will be a, uh, a guidance document coming out of that W3C work, and that will probably, I'm hoping, will lead to additional W3C activity around application profiles, which we may be able to combine with some of what we've already done in Dublin Core. And definitely the Dublin Core work is more advanced actually than, um, than anyone else. And both the DCAT uh, application profiles and the BibFrame application profiles were done by people who have been involved in Dublin Core and are uh, largely based on the, um, the work that, that has been done in Dublin Core. So at this point, um, let's see if there are questions. You can ask anything. Yes. Um, uh, I, I, would, I would ask the participants to please put questions in the, you should have in your, uh, in the right of your screen, questions. Uh, a, a place to put the questions. Some of you are putting questions in the chat. I will read them, but the other the other uh, fields are better because they have your identification. And uh, in this one, I can see your identification. So uh, thank you, thank you, Karen. Thank you very much. This is this was quite a lesson, and I thank you very much because I am also a professor. And uh, I was going to do some um, uh, a video for my students about application profiles, and I don't know, I don't need to do it anymore because this is great. This is great. Um, I, I I noticed I have a question here uh, about uh, the, the difference uh, for you to uh, please clarify the difference between an application profile and a metadata schema or a database schema or uh, whatever, mm -hmm. a, a, yeah. a, a yeah. set of uh, properties. Right. To me, the main difference is that an application profile also includes information required for the, the human view, which a metadata schema, let's say you do an XML schema for uh, your properties uh, doesn't necessarily have. So although there, you, you could have a, um, a metadata schema that is essentially the same as an application profile, to me, uh, a big difference is the, the goals. And the goals are not just to be machine readable, but the goal is also to provide all of that information uh, for humans and all of that information that you need to gain that consensus. So I agree with you that, that, that there, there isn't a bright line between one and the other. 
Um, but I mean, I think we've, <clears throat> I, I have had the experience often of asking someone for the documentation for their metadata and getting basically a list of terms. And that to me is not sufficient to be a profile. Okay, um, I, I heard, um, I, I have been following your work in the Dataset Exchange Working Group. Uh, so you are working in a, in a definition also about application profile. Is this definition going to, in, in the same line of, of, the, of the one that you, that you uh, presented now? I believe so. Yeah, okay. We aren't yet at a point that I can say for sure, yes, we're still developing requirements, but I believe that it, it will support the view, uh, at least partially support the view of the Dublin Core application profile. And, um, <clears throat> and as I say, it's, it's not going to develop something actual machine readable um, and, and, and actionable. So my hope is that in essence, that the, the document that comes out of the, the DXWG, this working group, uh, will essentially form uh, the basis for W3C being able to look at application profiles as actionable uh, code. And so in essence, W3C is just now getting to the point that Dublin Core was at in 2007 in terms of thinking about the Singapore framework. Yeah. So uh, yeah. We, we are further advanced. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so we have many questions here. Okay, let's go. Uh, okay. So another question is, what do you do when, uh, when functional requirements blur with interface uh, slash application requirements. Um, so I think uh, this participant wants to uh, uh, know the, the difference in uh, the concept of functional requirements and uh, uh, maybe, I don't know, data requirements or uh, information requirements. Yeah. To my mind, functional requirements should cover all of those. In other mm -hmm. words, you want to you, you want to know the requirements for your data in all of the environments where your data will be used. So um, the reason why they're functional is simply because what that means is that you are defining requirements in terms of what you want to do and what outcomes you want but it should include everything that you need to do with your data to the extent that you know it at the time. Okay, we have another question here that is, uh, I'm going to add something because the question uh, doesn't have everything that, that uh, I'm going to say, but I think it, this is the meaning. So when you have that table uh, with um, uh, that table in Excel or in Word or whatever, with uh, the basics of your application profile. Um, uh, the, this person is asking, how would you represent a data element for which you have both uh, um, IRI, uh, IRI uh, I don't know how to say this. IRI, one. yeah. yeah. IRI and a text label. I mean, so they have, a, 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 they can have both values. Uh, uh, a label and the IRI, a text label so, and IRI. Yeah, so let me bring up this. <clears throat> I mean, this is a good example of it. The, uh, this is, they're calling it URI, but it's essentially IRI. Mm -hmm. And um, you have your label, they call it property, but I would probably call that label. Um, this is a shortened IRI. Right, that when you expanded this, it would this would be an entire HTTP, uh, <clears throat> which doesn't fit very well, you know, uh, it is too long, but but that's what this means. So it isn't terribly difficult to provide these, and in the um, what we're 
hopefully doing it in, in the work that we're doing is you can see that we have both the property and this would have to be an HTTP property. And we also have the display name, which would be a label along with description and usage notes and various other things. So um, those all can fit very nicely into <clears throat> a spreadsheet. And you get this spreadsheet actually has the same data as I just showed you in the DCAT, the one with the blue, blue lines. Does that answer the question? I am not sure if this is if, if this was the meaning. Uh, if the if the the person that asked this question, if 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 the person wants to add something, please let let me know. I'm going to add something now. And how about in the values? I mean, not in the description of the property, not in the, the reference to the property, but in the values. So you have a property where you have a value that can be either uh, IRI uh, pointing to something, to, uh, to a resource that is an instance of a given class, or that uh, may have um, a literal, a literal as, as a, the range of that value, right, or right. both. Yeah. How, do we, how do we say okay. that? So there's the RDF way of doing it, which is that you would say this is an owl object property or, or, <clears throat> or this is an annotation property. Um, the way that I'm envisioning it at the moment, and this may change, um, is that you have different types of values. So this, unfortunately, I don't have the whole thing here, but you can have a data type value, you can have a literal value, and those each have quite a bit of description associated with them. So that each, each value would have a name, a description, it would have notes, it would have examples. Um, <clears throat> there's quite a bit that you need to say. You could have lists, you could say that this goes to a list. There are, um, I saw recently a, um, that these uh, lists can be their own, um, have their own identifiers and you would point out to them. It does get fairly complex, but I do think that this is something that at least in terms of handling the majority of cases that we can do. Okay, uh, thank you. I, let's move on to another question. Uh, uh, this is something, uh, some uh, person that says, I teach metadata and cover application profiles. What would you say is the best introductory text to application profiles besides this video? <laughs> well, Anna, you can speak to the book that was published and, mm -hmm. uh, and that's pretty good. Um, for it, depending on how much detail you are uh, wanting, the Dublin Core Profile Guidelines is very simple and gives a good introduction to that. Um, I don't uh, remember who published the book, but there was a book about application profiles. I wrote an introduction and then there are um, different chapters. Anna, can you speak to that? Hi. Maybe not. Okay. Oh, but, sorry, um, I didn't understand, uh, Karen. You are you are asking the me book. To... <laughs> yes, I don't remember who published the book on application profiles that we did a year and a half ago. Book on application profiles. Ah, yes. Okay. Yes. We, yes. <laughs> it was. <laughs> it all just blends together. But, oh my God! Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. It was it was a book edited by me, uh, Paul Walk, and uh, Mariana Malta. I'm sorry, I was I was reading the the questions. Yeah, I was yeah. trying to do both things at the same time. Okay, it yeah. was a, a book edited by me and uh, uh, Mariana Malta and Paul Walk. Right. So and, if, uh, if, if, yeah. yeah, so if if you can't find it and, and we we can't pull it up here right now, you can always email me. Kcoil at kcoil.net and I'll mm -hmm. dig it up for you. Mm 
and uh, I may be able to uh, give you my introductory chapter as well. Yes, the book is called, uh, the title is Developing Metadata Application Profiles and it has, you know, some examples of, uh, we wanted to bring uh, um, uh, testimonies of people who have developed application profiles and not about the application profile, but how the application profile was developed. And uh, Karen Coyle did an introductory uh, chapter uh, to that book, very interesting, of course. So um, uh, you you can contact her, or you can yeah. contact me. It will be fine. Um, uh, we have another question uh, here that is: I found it hard to find any recent DC application profiles. Those I found uh, are prints and the collections. AP. Is there a place to find this and particularly those that are in use? There's no one single place there is now and unfortunately I didn't um, uh, dig that up beforehand. There, there, um, there is a, a website that's trying to gather application profiles from the cultural heritage environment uh, it is definitely not complete and again you can email me and I will give you that I have it bookmarked um, but one of the requirements that we are talking about in the W3C work is how to make application profiles discoverable online so um, what we would like is for you to be able to type in, you know, application profile, you know, I don't know, geographic or something like that, and be able to find all of the application profiles because as of today, it isn't terribly easy to discover them. So discovery is one of the requirements that we're going to try to address. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can add something to that. Some years, of, I don't remember how many years, four or five years ago, uh, Mariana Malte and I published an article that was called um, Panoramic View over Application Profiles, uh, something like that. And it was, um, it was uh, a, 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 a report on a work, uh, uh, on a work that Mariana did looking for application profiles in several domains. So if you access that, um, that um, article, then there is there a, a, a link to a, a, a file in a repository uh, where all the data about the application profiles that she could find till that uh, date, uh, where all the data about those application profiles is okay but this this study is as four or five years is four or five years old okay so um uh, it would be very interesting to have such a place yes but mm -hmm. this was the that the WCC is doing of course it's also very helpful because it will be it will is make it easier to to have such a service yes so, and uh, I think this is the last question. Um, Devon, I don't know if you have any questions there for me. If you don't, this is the last question. No, this is the last question. Okay. How does this, I mean, this application profiles relate to data dictionaries? There are a lot of overlaps. Um, and it depends on exactly what data dictionary and how you're defining data dictionary. They're very close. Data dictionaries tend to be referring to um, uh, database-based data, and therefore it has a database view. Um, data dictionaries can include some helpful uh, information for humans. Data dictionaries, however, are inside a database or connected to a database. 
So they aren't as exchangeable. The idea of application profiles is that they will be as accessible as your data is on the web. So you might think, if you think of the web, as some people do, as a database, then perhaps application profiles are the data dictionary for the web. OK. We have all the questions answered. Uh, so I will start to uh, thank you again, uh, Karen, for this great webinar. Thank you all the participants for having participated and also for having uh, uh, done the questions, put the questions. And uh, um, let me remind you that next month we have two more webinars, DCMI webinars, okay? Uh, so I hope to, to not see you, but listen to you <laughs> or read to your questions next month. I hope you can. Okay, so thank you, Devon. Thank you. you can. Um, attention all uh, participants, the recording will be ready in 24 to 48 hours and it will be sent to all registered attendees. So be on the lookout for that. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.